Hello, Trailblazers. Welcome to the Trailblazers Palette Podcast. I'm your host, Sancha Marshall, and today is a true delight because we have a very special guest, a talented musician who creates melodies that embrace stillness and tranquility. I've always been captivated by the power of music to evoke emotions and transport us to a place of serenity. Today, we have the privilege of diving into the world of music for stillness with none other than the incredible Richard Goldsworthy. Richard's music is a beautiful symphony of simplicity, crafted with the sound of a resonant grand piano. His compositions have the unique ability to calm the mind and create moments of profound peace. In this episode, we'll explore Richard's inspiring journey as a musician, how he discovered his passion for creating music that calms and embraces listeners. We'll delve into the experiences and adventures that have shaped his compositions and brought stillness to countless knives. So Trailblazers, get ready to be moved and inspired by Richard's musical artistry. Let's give a warm welcome to Richard Goldsworthy and let's dive right in. Hi there, Sanchia. Thank you so much for having me. So starting out, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, share with the listeners, um, you know, how did you start out? As, as a musician, like what was your path that led you to become a musician? Right. Well, if, we, if we're going to go way, way back to my childhood, yeah. my parents say that from the time I was a toddler, if I ever saw a piano, I would just walk over to it and start trying to play it. So it almost feels like playing the piano was in my DNA or I somehow came in here with that being what I meant to do. But how I was going to do that um, was was definitely something that had to get worked out on the way. So there was always the desire to play. And after a few years of me just constantly trying to play pianos, my parents went, well, I guess we better send this kid to piano lessons. And one thing that happened very fortunately, I had a terrific teacher who was quite strict in training me in classical piano, but also recognised that I liked other kinds of music. I had started to dabble with writing my own music, even as a kid. Mm. And I remember she sat me down one day when she was about 10, when I was about 10 years old, and she said to me, now listen, if you want to be a good pianist, we have to train you properly. That means you have to do Bach and Mozart and scales and the things that I give you. But as long as you do that, we can still do the other things you like to play. We can still work on your own music. And um, even though I was about 10, that kind of made sense to me. And it's sort of like with any professional occupation, whether it be a creative one like painting or theatre or acting or whatever, or even a sports person, you still have to train. You still have to get your body and your um, abilities in the place where you can create what you want. And um, that kind of made sense with me. And I remember making a little deal with myself when I was about 10 years old that um, I would do my training and then once that was finished, I'd go and do whatever I wanted. And I kind of stuck to that. So went through all the levels of classical piano and then when I was about uh, 21, went off and joined a rock band <laughs> yeah, and became yeah. a professional musician from then on. Yeah. Oh, tell us a little bit more about that because I, I didn't know that about you. Like how were your years doing that? It sounds quite like it was quite fun. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look, well, well. When, you, when you're 21 years old being in a rock and roll band, there's a lot of fun. You're kind of living yeah. the dream. And you don't, you, you don't get much sleep and you don't make much money. But when you're 21 years old, that doesn't really doesn't matter. matter. But, um, yeah, I always had a passion for music. So I did the mm. band for a couple of years and then I became, I went solo and I became, you know, what you'd call a piano bar entertainer, a wedding singer, that sort of thing. And... Mm. Um, did that quite, and also was in a duo with an African American soul singer for about seven wow. years. But I look at that now; it's like my apprenticeship. Probably yeah. um, the first twenty years of my life 
playing other people's music as well as dabbling in writing my own. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got to a point where playing other people's music just wasn't really floating my boat that much mm. and it wasn't in line with where where my true passions were. So I evolved to about 20 years ago becoming an entirely original musician and since then I've basically made a living from the music that I write. So it was a journey to get there and like I say, I think sometimes going out and playing other people's music, it does a lot for your confidence. You Mm. learn the tricks, you learn how songs are put together and, you know, what, what makes playing to an audience and all of that kind of thing. So it was all really valuable, but I did get to a point where I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that's um, that's really true, isn't it? In a lot of fields, it's like you have that, those sort of an initial learning years where it is whether, like you say, like playing someone else's music or, you mm-hmm. know, learning learning those basic skills that I guess come yeah. together to later give you your voice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think there was there was definitely a point though, which is probably relevant to you know the theme mm. of your podcast, where I had to make that decision between following my passions and being a musician or getting a real job, as they say. Yeah, yeah. and um, look, the the school counsellors don't really kind of shape you in the way of of being a professional musician no disrespect to them but yeah yeah, I absolutely agree (laughs) if you've got a true passion and a Mm. true um desire to do something um there's probably not going to be a roadmap for it there's probably not going to be a set out template there's probably not going to be rules you can follow and I did have a thing happen, which I often talk about when I was about 15 and we were with my dad and choosing my subjects to go into the senior part of high school. And look, my dad was a lovely man and a lovely dad. He, he, he supported me as much as he could, but he was a technician all of his life and he couldn't understand his son making a living in a creative way. So, Dad chose all of my subjects for senior and it was all doing maths and science, which happened Mm. to be, unsurprisingly, the things I was least good at. Yeah. And um, I just said, look, Dad, I can see what you've chosen for me and I can see why, but these are the least areas where my talents lie Mm. and and I don't like them. And um, if... He said, but you need to do those things if you're going to get a job. And Mm. I said, well, if I got a job doing those things, I'm not good at them and I don't like them. So I wouldn't be good at that job and I wouldn't like that job. So what's the point of that? Yeah. And um, he said, oh, you know, you don't get a job because you like it. You get a job because you have to get a job. And uh, being the stubborn little tourist that I was, I remember (laughs) thinking at 15 years old, you know what, buddy? I'm going to prove you wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, as I say, no disrespect to my dad. All he wanted was for me not to starve. Yeah, yeah. But it was probably that moment that made me determined to make a living out of my music and my creativity. Yeah. And do you think that you've always had that, like, strong sense of yourself and knowing what you want to do? I think you have to be in touch with your feelings about it. Yeah. And really, I think I got, I was always fairly good at going, how does doing this make me feel? Mm. Does it make me feel alive? Does it make me feel passionate? Does it make me feel like I'm doing what I'm meant to do? Mm. Or is this a chore? Does it feel wrong? Am I pretending to like this when I really don't? And I think you have to have the courage to let your feelings guide you about how Mm. you really, um, because I think that's been a lot of the road. And even when I was transiting from being, you know, a covers musician to an original musician, I got to the point where playing other people's music just 
didn't fill me with any joy anymore. Mm. And I thought I've got to find where my joy and my passion is and that lay with doing my own thing. Yeah, so it's sort of been a very natural journey for you to follow that and to follow that, you know, inner instinct, I guess, that um, in a world where, you know, I think we're often told to choose the logical path <laughs> and and it's that, um, and, I, and I see it with people who are more creatives that it, they do seem to have that stronger sense of self and following that intuition, I guess you would call it. Yeah, and I think a lot of the people who have created amazing things and have made huge contributions to this world, they didn't get there with a roadmap. They didn't no. <laughs> follow the church, you, you know, the established mm. path and that sort of thing. And you know, some of us need to need to have the courage to do that. Yeah. And I I think at the end of the day, if you're not a I not only want to fulfil myself, but I want to hopefully be of service to the world in creating music that relaxes and inspires people and also inspires people to, you know, follow their own dreams and their passions. And, yeah. you know, you just you have to have the courage to do that. And, yeah, mm. it's not always easy, but, gosh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a moment of it. Yeah, yeah. And I know even when I've heard your story and I've heard you talk about, you know, your journey and, how you've had that strong sense of self and you've followed your, I guess, pattern, it, it, it inspires me as well because I know there's times where, you know, I've had those voices in my head or in my family where it's like, oh, it's just a hobby or it's just this like little fun thing on the side that you don't really take seriously because <laughs> you can't fall back, <laughs> back on that. And that's still there sometimes. It's actually quite a hard thing to, to overcome. <laughs> yes, my my mum was actually quite funny because once my parents got to the use used to the idea of being a professional musician and that I was making a living and, you know, for a while making a very good living out of playing in five-star hotels and things like that. Um, they were fine with it. And um, then when I started being an original musician, you had to take a whole different tack and it meant – you know, doing gigs at little markets and festivals and places where people would connect with your original music. And um, mm. my mother didn't quite understand this and she'd have these moments where she'd say, are you sure you just don't want to go back and play in one of those nice hotels again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Mum, I definitely don't. <laughs> yeah, and when you know, you know, don't you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So... I guess, and we talk, we've talked about sort of how your um, music has evolved. So when you're creating, Richard, how do you find, like if you get a creative block or, you know, how do you spark new ideas? How do you find that inspiration and things like that? I learned a really good lesson um, probably nearly 20 years ago now where my last job as a professional piano bar guy was mm. in a hotel called the Ritz Carlton in Osaka in Japan. So I went out on a really good job yeah, and yeah. Um, getting flown to Japan and accommodated in Japan and, you know, living in luxury doing this job was great. But um, I decided I wanted to take time out and immerse myself in the Japanese culture mm. and um write an album before I came back mm. and I was in a very fortunate position that I'd had this good job, I'd had some money saved, I had some time on my visa where I could go and do that. So I went and rented a room in a little ryokan, a traditional Japanese inn, mm. um, in the mountains on the edge of Kyoto, the ancient capital of Japan, and I just went, I'm going to stay here till I've written an album. And to my surprise, it happened much, much more quickly than I ever imagined. Mm. And the reason it did happen is I had set that space aside for nothing else except writing music. And I still look back on what a beautiful time it was because I'd wake up in the morning with music in my head and I'd sit there and write. And then when I'd done whatever I could do, I would either go down the road to the historic part of Kyoto and work around, walk around um, temples and shrines and galleries and historic buildings and 
little parts of the town with, you know, old buildings and paved cobblestone streets and things like that. Mm. Or, and then I'd come back to my room and write some more music. Or I'd go the other way, which was up into the mountains and I'd go swimming in a walk, waterfall or hiking in the forest or climbing up a mountain to a little sacred shrine on top of it or something like that and then go back and write more music. Yeah. And I've learned for myself the creative process has two sides of it and one of them is definitely doing something, going somewhere or finding something that inspires you. But second half and equally important is making the space to let that happen. It's almost like for me I've got to clear the space in my head so that all of the ideas and the creativity can flow in. And I find once I do that, it happens really quickly and really spontaneously. But if I'm trying to create in the middle of me doing everything else that you normally have to do um, in life, it's mm. a lot harder. And, you know, that may come down to the fact that I'm just a male, so I'm not a multitasker. I just need to do one thing at once. But mm. that's what really works for me. Yeah, it sounds like so. it would be like I'm just thinking as an artist, <laughs> but it would be such an immersive experience, like even just the things you were describing in Japan there. I imagine you couldn't not help but feel inspired to, mm. I guess, pour that into what into your music. And so I imagine, you know, listening to your music, that that's why it is such an immersive experience as well for the listener, that, you know, it transports you to that place or to that feeling. Hmm. I guess I want to create it as authentically as I can. And um, even now, I I haven't necessarily gone away to a place and written an album again. I might do a, sh a shorter version of that, like go somewhere for two or three days at a time, but I will set that time aside to just be writing music. And... Hmm. Um, I find, yeah, that works really, really well. I can literally, I have my few favourite re retreat places that I go to and I can literally walk through the door of them and music just starts flying into my head. So yeah. it's very much about, you know, creating the space. And, yeah, and like I say, just, just doing it as authentically as you can, not not trying to copy something, not going, not trying to sound like something that you know, you think people will like, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, because I know um, I know a lot of creatives struggle with that too, you know. Is, is that originality? Is that, um, you know, finding your your voice and your creative process and, and feeling like, like staying true to that? And I think, you know, with social media and all that, we have, we have so much bombardment that I can imagine, yeah, going to that, that sort of retreat would make that a lot easier. Yeah. It is, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you just have to be authentic. And, yes, that's scary. When you put out a piece of music or a painting or whatever, you know, you're really, you're naked in front of the world. Yeah, this is yeah, you. you feel that and judgment. Your, <laughs> and your creativity and your emotions and everything there for the world to see. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's yeah, th there's always a little bit of anxiety that goes with it. I'd I don't know if anybody ever gets over that. Okay, yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, do you still find that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at times. And, and, and look, we all, I, I think part of the human condition is we're kind of like, what will people think? But the test that I come back to is at the end of the day, do I love this? Mm. And that's my test for putting something out because I always say I have to fall in love with the piece of music myself before I can expect anyone else to love it. And yeah. if, I, if I've if i fallen in love with what I've written and I've done the best that I can in that moment, that's that's all I can do. Yeah, yeah. So looking at that, like that, because that's such a the creative side of things, how do you find when you then, you know, starting out with your music and doing your original music, how did you find the transition between and the balance between the the creative side and the business side of things. Yeah, and there's there's the key. It's um you you touched on it 
we I'm sure all of us would love nothing more than just to sit in our studios and paint yeah. or create or whatever to to our heart's content and not have to worry about the other side of it. But mm. um, it's a business. Most of us are not in the position where we can pay a whole little army of people to do all of that yeah, sort right. of things for us. Um, so, yeah, I think you have to divide your creative time and your practical time, as I was saying. But also the smartest people I've met who are successful original musicians are not only people who are really talented but really informed mm. and keep yourself. Maybe you'll get to a point one day, we'll all get to a point one day where we don't have to do all the books and all the social media yeah. posts and all of those things, mm. but we still need to know how that all works. Mm. And so being in, being informed is power and yeah. you will put what you put out into the world with more confidence if you know that. And I think people often ask me this sort of question and I think the only reason I've managed to have the level of success that I have so far is that I'm definitely not the most talented or the most creative or the most inspired person, but I have enough mix of creativity and practicality mm. that I can find a place somewhere in the middle and make it work. And I think, funnily enough, I, I, can, be, I can be totally off with the fairies but at the end of the day, I'm really quite a practical person as well. Yeah. And um, one little diversion I did have, um, I did go to uni for a little while doing a degree in business and majoring in marketing and advertising. And I fairly quickly discovered that I had no desire to work in that industry full time. Yeah. But there is a bit of my brain that I can switch into that mode when I need to and it has actually come in really handy. Yeah, I was going to so, say, have you found that really beneficial? Yeah. Yeah, you know, sometimes we still have the experiences we meant to have and they may not seem relevant to anything but you look back later and you go, oh, yeah, that's why I needed to go and learn about that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think. Well, I did two years of early childhood teaching, and we homeschool the kids now. So I was like, that came in really handy, <laughs> actually. There you go. <laughs> yeah. At the time, I went, I don't want to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But doing it with your own kids is a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's sort of that path that we have is somehow you know meant to and be. Yeah, right. And, yeah. So I can sort of have these moments where. I step out of myself and see myself as a product and go, okay, well, how would I present this to people? And, and yeah, yeah, and that's even if you don't have experience in that, that's sometimes a good thing to do. Just step mm. outside yourself and look at yourself as, you know, it, it sounds really commercial, but we, we can get so emotionally involved in what yes. we do as creatives yeah. that sometimes you need to be able to set it aside too and just step outside yourself and, and look at it differently and go, okay, you know, what's how how would how would I like the world to see this and, and yeah, what yeah. ways could I get that across? And um you have to I think you have to be prepared to to put yourself out there. I mean mm. I don't think there's it's very easy to get obsessed with things like social media and how many mm. likes and views and follows and streams and goodness knows what you have so mm. you know it, it's don't go down that but that's that's only a path of um you, of judging judging yourself very falsely yeah. but um you do you do have to be prepared to put yourself out there but you know do do it in a do it in a healthy way, I yes, guess, is yeah. what I'm saying. And, you know, if everybody completely masters that, please come and tell us. But yeah. <laughs> that's, be good that's hear, the it? intention anyway, I think. But just being mindful of that. Yeah, because I know I, I've struggled with that too, that balance of all that love-hate relationship with, you know, social media and things like that. It, it, it can be a, a hard one, I think, as a creative person. Hmm. Well, look, at the end of the day, 
it is a way to share your art with people. That's right, yeah. It's Is it really different to, you know, having your music playing on the radio or having your picture in an art gallery? And some people yeah. will walk past and go, wow, that's amazing, and other people will walk past and go, oh, no, nah, not really for me. Yeah. And that's the world we're in. Yeah, and so, I think that's exactly it. And, and if we see it that way, we see, you know, as I guess a line in the water or however you want to put it is, it's just another yeah. way to to reach people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So when, um, I was going to wanted to talk about, like, technology in your industry. So, like, how have you found, I guess, embracing some technologies, leaving some behind, like, you know, I guess with the, you know, the evolution of Spotify and things like that? Absolutely. Look, um, that's been a huge journey and, and with anyone artistic and now just just to add to the mix, we we have the whole AI thing starting I know, to that's such a huge nobody thing really it. understands that too. <laughs> I think one thing it's taught me to do is be really nimble. Um, I could, when you think of not much more than 10 years ago, if you heard some music that you liked, um, the only way that you could get that music was to go and buy it on a CD. Yeah. And that it, it was very simple. So so I sold CDs, people bought them. And, and that wasn't that, was, that long ago, was it? Because I think that's originally no. how when I first came across your music at the markets and, you know, I think we did get your CD and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, and the world has changed dramatically since then. But, um, and it's very easy, very easy to be negative about it. Um, but we, we're in an age where everything is evolving so fast. Yeah. And we need to em- embrace what we can and endure what we must, I guess. Yeah, and yeah. I did. I did hear a very interesting comment about things like Spotify, and mm. there's a there's a folk English folk musician called Billy Bragg. I don't know if you've heard for him. He was quite big in like the 1980s, 90s sort of thing, and he'd be in his 60s now. And he was being interviewed about Spotify, and someone said to him, "Oh, I guess you hate all this digital streaming stuff." And he said, "No, I love it because um, it's introduced me to a whole new audience." And he um, shared this example of in the 1920s when radio was first um, invented and began Mm. broadcasting, apparently all the musicians in New York went on strike and were really opposed to radio and they said, you know, our our careers are over, our lives are ruined because who is going to come out and watch us play live on a snowy New York night? when they can sit at home and listen to us on the radio. And so they were completely negative about radio and they they wanted it banned. (laughs) And the outcome was not only did radio um, promote their music, it promoted their music way more to Mm. way greater an audience than they Mm. ever could have done physically. (laughs) <laughs> and um, he just said, "That's my feeling with Spotify and digital streaming." And yeah. I have to, I have to say that for me, that is exactly what happened. So I'm based, I'm based in the Sunshine Coast in Australia. Most yeah. of my listeners are in the US. Yeah. I've never met them. I've never played for them live, but um, yeah. they all listen to my music. Yeah. Yeah, true. And that anything can have its pros and cons. And in that way, you know, that's a huge pro for you as a musician yeah. because those people can listen to your music that they wouldn't have met you at the markets or something. Yeah. And I think my advice is stay in touch, be informed, but don't be too attached to anything because as yeah. soon as you get attached to it, it's going to change because technology is just like that at the moment. I'm yeah. I'm wondering whether the sort of thing that is happening in the film industry at the moment is also going to happen in the music industry. I, mm. I would watch this space with that. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think stay informed, use things to your advantage, but once again don't be obsessed with how many views or how many streams or whatever. You've got to, you've got to trust 
that if you're creating from your heart and your soul that yeah. you will put it out there and it will find its appropriate audience. There's really trust in the end of the day. Yeah, and that knowing of, yeah, where you want to head. So how have you found, um, you know, I guess with the technology in your industry, um, you know, you have a very authentic, real sound with using, you know, the piano and that, whereas I know there's a there's probably another side of that where there's a lot of um, technology used in the creation of music itself. Like how do you find that balance? Uh, look, I've struggled with that. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, the sound I've embraced for my own music is the full resonant sound of a grand piano. I've found mm. a beautiful grand piano that I'm, it is a 100-year-old 12-foot Bosendorfer grand, um, which has an incredible resonance built into it without even adding any effects. And mm. um, it's big, it's beautiful, it's clear, it's, it's amazing. And it translates the style of music I write under my name, Richard Goldsworthy, perfectly. But um, there have been a lot of different types of technology explored, and even within piano, there is a sound that's very popular in the neoclassical world called felted or muted piano, and that's basically piano played with the soft pedal on or with the, with the felts against the strings, and that kind of gives the opposite of my sound, which is a very muted, very soft, very mysterious, almost melancholy kind of sound. And um, as I said, it's become incredibly popular um, mm. in neoclassical music and on a lot of Spotify playlists and things like that. So um, I thought I would like to explore this, but it didn't fit with the music I was releasing under Richard Goldsworthy. So I developed another personality, which is um, I have called Piano Within, mm. and I've started composing music in this style and releasing it. And um, it's been very, very creatively stimulating, I have to say, because yeah. it's given me an opportunity to play with something I wouldn't normally do and create in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, so tell, tell us a bit more about that, I guess, because I know that <clears throat> I worked with you on one of your, I think, first releases with Remembering Flowers. Yes. And and you've been pairing up, I think, with each release with an artist, and I've seen a few of the others as well. And, you know, I guess talk to us a bit about that pairing and how you found that. Yeah, well, when I decided I wanted to compose and release some music in this way, I was looking for a different angle on it. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, it's very popular at the moment and there's a lot of that kind of music being released. And I thought, how can I take a different approach to, one, try to make me stand out from a crowd, make it stimulating for me? And I have a lot of <laughs> friends and people I know like yourself, who are wonderful artists. And I thought, I wonder if I can get art and music involved here. So I developed the concept of piano within around a story, and it's basically a person, the story starts with a person walking in the late afternoon. They come across an old deserted house and they open the door and they go inside and explore and in the deserted house is an old piano and it's the late afternoon and sun is streaming through the window, illuminating the dust in the air. And they sit down and play this piano and as they play, all of these memories of times long past come back to them. And each piece from Piano Within is a memory and an experience and so I thought I would like to compose a piece of music, then give that piece to an artist mm. along with the story of that piece, like a little piece of prose I write that describes mm. the story and have them create a work that inspires that. And then also um, video making YouTube videos, 
sort of in very much in sepia and very sort of creative and mysterious um, mm. has been a part of it too. And the lovely thing is that each artist has then taken it and enhanced or created their own story from it as well. So, and we've we've really bounced off each other creatively, yeah. which has just been a wonderful experience. So yeah. I'm having a lot of fun with Piano Within at the moment. Yeah, because I know when I worked, I got your piece, remember, The Remembering Flowers, and it had the prose. I couldn't help but not feel inspired because, like, I think po- I would have to say poetry and music are probably two of my biggest inspirations apart from, you know, maybe nature and that sort of stillness you find in nature. And so it was really easy to, I guess, come up with that and feel that imagery and then create something. So, I, yeah, I really appreciated working with you on that and having that, you know, I feel, I, it felt like a very natural and beautiful collaboration. And I think as artists we're all storytellers. Yes. It doesn't matter whether we actually write words or not. Mm or whether we even create a tangible story. Maybe we have a story in our head when we create, but when people listen to my piece of music or view one of your paintings, they've got their own story in their head of what it means. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's great. But, yeah, you know, we're all all storytellers and when you Mm. have the chance to actually combine and tell some of that story together, that can be quite magical. I think, yeah, I think it's quite powerful actually because I know, and I don't know if I've shared this with you, but the lady who actually ended up buying that painting, um, so she works in energy work and does what they call spinal flow and she actually bought the piece because I'd done the girl with uh, her back exposed at the piano. So she bought that piece for her office where you could see the spine, but she's also a huge fan of yours, Richard, and she loved your music. So I think that that collaboration, um, you know, obviously spoke to her and um was it meant something to her which was a really beautiful story wow and and you know and that is exactly the kind of outcome that i would have wished for from it so so that you know when there are people sometimes people are fans of the art sometimes people are fans of the music sometimes Mm. they're fans of it all but if if it's combining to to put it all out there that's definitely what I have and that's why I love like for example the I I worked with a couple of other you know painters and then the latest piano within release that has just come out is called the pearl Mm. and I actually worked with a silversmith and a jeweller. I think I just saw that actually. It's beautiful, yeah. Yeah. I love that story of the pearl and the pearl in the silver piece. Yeah, so she actually created a piece of wearable art inspired by the music. So that took it in a whole different direction again and that was was just fantastic. Mm. And um, as I worked with Beth and she shared her interpretations of the story, it also evolved for me as well. And I'm currently making the YouTube video and um, there's the way we've evolved the story together is, is very much in that. So, so that one will hopefully be ready pretty soon, but yeah. it's, it's a great way. Look, look, collaborations are magical things to do. I, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't recommend them more highly. And mm. I think also sometimes a lot of what we do, we're really doing it alone. We're solitary. Yes. We're doing it our own. And there are very few people who even really understand what it, what we do I mean even sometimes our families and our partners and the people closest to us they love us and they support us but they don't always really get what's in our heads yeah and and I think yeah yeah and and I think having finding those collaborations where somebody's joined you for that little part of the journey can Mm. just give you so much energy and um you know so make you feel like you know, you, you're not really alone doing this, which, you know, we often all do feel. Yeah, yeah, very true. And that's what that was my experience with it as well. Mm. So, like, looking at the, then the, like, you would have, I imagine, a very particular type of um, customer with your music. Like, have you ever had, like, do you have any stories around, like, unexpected customers or people who you wouldn't really, um, wouldn't be your traditional listener. Yeah, look, it um, I that's that's something I've learned 
because um no there's you you would you would think I fit quite um easily into a box because my music is mm. piano it's relaxing it's you know obviously does have an appeal to the older generation but um, one of the most delightful things is that people all across the whole spectrum, from kids that go to sleep to it, and I know you've experienced that with, with your children's ads, yeah. which is one of the ways that we met, to, to you know, adults who play it at work, to people who play it in nursing homes. And um, often it's the person who you least expect will um, connect with it, and I remember uh, there was this one. Um, what one, one story that comes to mind is one gig I was doing in a fine art market, and there was a guy um, walking sort of over the other side of the street, and he stopped and listened to me. And he was wearing a singlet; most of his body was tattooed. He was he was certainly a person you wouldn't have picked a fight with <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if you'd met him in the street. And um, he just stopped and stared at me and then he walked over to me and I was almost waiting for him to say something smart or say, oh, do you know any ACDC or <laughs> something like that? And he just said, mate, I just want to tell you that is some of the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life and I just had to stop for a moment and listen and mm -hmm. I wanted you to know that. Wow. And I kind of took a deep breath and said thank you and said, yep, lesson again, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> yeah, it's so true, isn't it? And I think music that is just piano has mm. an incredibly wide appeal these days, mm. way more diverse than I would have ever imagined. Mm. And part of that is things like Spotify introducing it to people who probably otherwise wouldn't have listened to it. And, you know, you know, it sort of fits into uh, apparently piano music is the most played music on Spotify. You would think it's, you know, pop or rock. Pop or, or something. Yeah, something that's, that's I guess what I would have thought. <laughs> apparently. And I think because piano music is something people will put on to listen to over and over again in the background and things like that. So, mm. um, yeah, you never know where your art is going to end up and who it will appeal to. And um, I think I've, ha I've had to learn to be very open-minded about that and just yeah. very grateful for whoever does connect with it. Yeah, it's very true, isn't it? Because, you know, and I know we're taught in marketing things like, you know, your customer avatar and things like that, and sometimes that doesn't really fit. <laughs> no, no. At the end, once again, I think I come back to saying just being your authentic self yeah. in itself is attractive to people mm. and they can just see, um, you know, you're there presenting what you love to the world and what you're most passionate about and, mm. um but there's something about that that I think people do appreciate and people do do get. Maybe not everybody, but more than you think. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess, like, I know you're you're pursuing your felted piano at the moment. Do you have like any other sort of, I guess, pursuits you would like to do in the future? Or hmm. I'm um yeah, I'm also doing a sacred music project. Um. And it's basically also piano, but some versions of traditional sacred music pieces plus pieces I've composed myself plus um, pieces that my friend Nathan Siler has composed as well. Mm. And um, I'm also releasing that under another name called The Reverence Project just because I don't want the music to be associated with any particular religion or spirituality. I just yeah. want it to be sacred music for people to enjoy and embrace in whatever way they feel is appropriate, regardless of their religious or spiritual beliefs. And mm. um, I personally um, have always loved traditional sacred music. It's one of the things that has most um influenced me musically 
Mm. And as I say, apart from, you know, any religious or spiritual aspect to it. And the same, I when I was in Japan, I was very influenced by um, the Zen philosophy and I learned a lot about creating my music that, like, I didn't I didn't go and become a Buddhist, but I um, mm. Yeah, but the I principles, some, yeah. Yeah, and... Um, that was that was a key. I remember, um, just as an example of how I connected with it creatively. I remember I would walk into the temples or the shrines or the Japanese gardens, and it was just like this wave of peace would wash over you. Mm. And um, apart from any religious or spiritual aspect to it, I was just kind of going, okay, you know. What's going on here? What is it that's making me feel like this? And when I looked into the Zen philosophy, even in architecture and design and that sort of thing, I learned that it's very much about space. It's about simplicity of form. And they have this saying in Zen, um, what's not there is just as important as what is. And that kind of gave me a key to work with. And um, I started approaching music from that uh, point of view. And, you know, they sometimes refer to it as the spaces between the notes. Mm. And um, I think I learned an important lesson about leaving those spaces. And I now look back at when I first started composing, and maybe this is a bit the same for you with with painting Sanchia, but when you knew it, you've got all these ideas and all these things you're excited about and you want to put all of this stuff into it. And you can sometimes overcrowd things really easily, mm. but you get to a point where you have to, with my style of music particularly, you have to step back and learn that less is more. Mm. Yeah, and, and that sort of simplicity, isn't it? It's sort of... Mm. Yeah, that stillness, or because I know that your music is is very much what gives you that is that peace, that inner peace. Yeah, and what I've learned is that that's very much what people are looking for at the moment. I mean, I have mm. people who hear me playing or listen to my music, and um, I, I, as I say, I call it music for stillness. And people will come and say to me, "I really need to be still, and I just don't know how anymore." I've got yeah. all of these demands on me. I've got all these things I listen to me. I've got all these people who talk to me, all these things I have to do. Mm. And so if I can help with that in that way, as in creating that music that can just take people to their still place, when that that then gives them their chance to meditate or create or reflect or just come back to their centre, yeah. And, you know, that's that's something I would like to be able to, you know, give to the world, I guess, and it really uh, it gives me a lot of happiness and fulfilment to know that people are actually using it in that way. Yeah, and because I, I know for me personally, I when I'm creating, like when I'm actually painting and in the moment, there's not much I can listen to. Like I can't do the pop and all that because it's just too mm. anything with words and that is too distracting. So I know yours is one of the only ones I can listen to that actually does give me that, um, I guess, space and that I can focus without it being too too noisy or distracting. Yeah, thank you. And I think I think that's the thing and often I will even see when I'm playing live that people will just kind of stop or even young children who are really sort of active We'll just kind of stop and slow down and sometimes they'll look at me and they'll consciously register with the music. Sometimes they'll just it'll just touch them subconsciously, but either way, that's great. And you know, creating those bits of space in our lives is so important. I mean, mm. it's very easy these days for our lives to be very cluttered with we have this these huge lists of things that we should be doing, whether it's to succeed or whether it's demands from our family, our friends, the people close to us or whatever. We, we always end up with this huge list of shoulds, which is, mm -hmm. I think, <laughs> impossible to complete. Yeah. And it's, a, it's allowing ourselves to step back and say no. And mm -hmm. um, 
no, I, I will do what I can, but I also need to create this space just for me because I know I work more effectively in the world that way and I'm a better friend, I'm a better partner, I'm a better I'm better at all of those things if I have that space. Yeah, yeah, really true. And so what um I guess for in finishing up, what sort of advice would you give to maybe creatives in in finding their own voice and in um even pursuing a creative career? Yeah. Well, um I think if my story shows anything is that you there'll be a point where you've got to take a leap of faith yeah um there's not a roadmap as i say and you know some of us take small leaps of faith some of us take huge leaps of faith <laughs> like off a, off a cliff and hope we can fly but yeah. and, and that's not for everyone but it will involve taking that leap of faith it will involve bearing your soul in front of the world and putting yourself out there in ways that you're sometimes not comfortable with. But um, think about once again how fulfilling that feels for you and, two, what you're actually able to give to people and the ways that you're able to inspire people by doing that. So I guess that's my case for doing it. Um, As I said, be, be as authentic authentic as you can and I think if there's one trend even in social media now it's people are looking for authenticity um a few years ago everyone wanted to watch the Kardashians Mm. um what is most watched now is authentic people being themselves and doing their own thing so um People want to see the real you, particularly as a creative person. They find that interesting. They find it fascinating. Mm. And I've always had a bit of a problem talking about it. I've thought, me, whack, who wants to listen to me waxing lyrical about myself? But mm. a lot of people do. And um, if you can then help people tap into their own space and their own creativity or even give them ways in their life that that inspires that inspires them then that's that's a great thing so you know be courageous be authentic and you know be kind to yourself you're never going to be able to do everything you never you you know you you not everything you do people are going to love not everything you do is going to be successful and you know we at the end, we're all our own harshest critics and being able to shut that down a bit and just say, I've done the best I can with this and I love this and if other people love it too, that's great. And that means that doesn't mean you don't look at trends and look at what people respond to and go, oh, hey, okay, that's had a really good response. Maybe I should go down that path a bit more. You know, there's not to say you don't do that, but... At the end of the day, you've got to be authentic and you've got to love what you're putting out there. Yeah, yeah. I think that is really good advice. And um, thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing your um, journey and music with us. And where can people find you and listen to your music, Richard? Okay. Um, Well, if you want to find it all in one place, um, my website is richardgoldsworthy.net. And um, that has the links to all of my music and my musical projects, including the links to where you can listen to me on the digital platforms. It also has a page dedicated to the Piano Within project where people can read the stories and see the art that you created as well as the other artists. So um, that's the best way. Or otherwise, if you're just on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, whatever, type in either Richard Goldsworthy or Piano Within and you'll find me that way as well. And um, feel free to keep track of what I do on Facebook or Instagram or send me a message if you want to chat about anything. I love getting feedback from people as well. And you also do markets, don't you, Richard? 
Yeah. You know, I with the kind of music I do, it's not the sort of thing that people are always going to want to see in a big concert hall. Um, so I love the situations where I can go to little fine art markets and festivals and places where people are chilled, people are walking around enjoying themselves. You're surrounded by other creative people and the music just sort of creates a creates a background and an atmosphere there. And, um, yeah, I, I love doing gigs in those kind of situations. That's originally what allowed me to start making a living as an original musician when it was selling CDs in those situations. And now it's much more about people hearing me and going and following me on Spotify or liking my playlists or something like that. But um, I still love that personal contact and that personal connection with people. And um, I think no matter how successful I became, I would always want to do that in some way. If you're just yeah. sitting in your little tower all by yourself creating music, you don't get that interaction. And as an artist, I do find that really important. Yeah. And so you and people can find you for locals. I think you do your Monday market still? Yes. So um, normally I'm at your Monday markets on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And every couple of weeks, I also go to a beautiful little market in the city in Brisbane called Riverside of the Gardens, which is in the City Botanic Gardens. And so if people check my website, there's a, there's a gig guide which always says which days I'm there if you want to come and check out what I do and say hello. Awesome. We can pop those um, those links in the show notes. But, Richard, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was so great to chat to you today. Thank you, Sanchia. And as I said, it's always great to have a chat with other creatives and share our experiences, share our journey and hopefully inspire each other. Thank you for joining us on the Trailblazers Poet Podcast. We appreciate your support. Don't forget to subscribe and share if you enjoyed the episode. Stay tuned for more inspiring conversations with incredible guests. Keep blazing your trail and until next time, stay inspired. This is Sancha, your host, signing off. See you soon, trailblazers.